Good morning. I'm Leila Halal, director of the Middle East program at the New America Foundation. I want to thank uh, the uh, Open Technology Institute of New America and the delegation of the European Union for very quickly mobilizing to pull together this important event. I am pleased to be able to host a discussion on what more can be done to address Syria's humanitarian crisis with European Commissioner Krista Lina Georgieva. Commissioner Georgieva has been a vociferous proponent of increased humanitarian assistance for victims of Syria's conflict in European and UN forums. She has personally visited the region six times over the past two years, visiting refugee camps, border areas, meeting with Syrian and Palestinian refugees and aid workers, as well as hostess authorities. At the same time, she has been uh, adamant to point out the urgent need to meet the needs of Syrians inside the country. Throughout her tenure as commissioner, she has been an extremely active public figure, emphasizing care of the most vulnerable in places of immense crisis. Prior to her current position for, as European Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid, and Crisis Response, Dr. Georgieva was VP and Corporate Secretary of the World Bank Group. She has held numerous senior advisory and managerial posts with the bank in the economic and environmental sectors, and she served as World Bank Director for the Russian Federation in 2004. She is an economist by training and taught at the University of National and World Economy in Sofia, Bulgaria for many years at the start of her career, with visiting professorships and fellowships at the University of London School of Economics, Fiji's University of the South Pacific, and the Australian National University. Commissioner Georgieva brings to her current role a special commitment passion, and sense of responsibility for human victims of conflict and crisis. I'm very pleased to welcome her to the stage, but before, um, I, before she comes, I want to just point out a few procedural matters. Um, we have until 12.30 with the commissioner. She's on a tight schedule in high demand, so she'll have to leave promptly at 12.30. She'll speak for approximately uh, 15, 20 minutes. Um, I will have a short dialogue with her, and then we will open it up for the audience to ask questions. So without further ado, Commissioner, thank you. Thank you. Can I speak Please. with you? OK, Please. thank you. I, I do prefer to be able to uh, see all of you. Uh, thank you, Laila. Thank you all for coming. Uh, there is uh, no day that uh, passes I don't spend worrying on uh, what the Syrian crisis is causing to the Syrian people, to the neighborhood, and as a risk for the world. It is the most dramatic humanitarian catastrophe of recent decades. Uh, I wanted to start by just framing what has happened in one short year, how much since September, la September last year, conditions have worsened. What you don't see here is the number of victims. Last year, there were 27,000 Syrians who lost their life. Today, there are over 115,000. Uh, last year, there were 2.5 million people who depended on aid, reaching them to just survive. Today, this is actually already outdated. We are talking about eight or more million. Last year, the displacements, people who were pushed out of their homes internally in Syria, were a very large number, 1.2 million. This year, they are over 4.3 million. And most dramatic increase in terms of refugees Last year, 270,000 people crossed the borders of the neighboring countries, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq. Some went to Egypt. This year, there are almost eight times more, 2.1 million people, with predictions that 
the number will continue to go. This on its own tells us that we have extraordinary circumstances to cope with. But beyond the scale of the crisis, what we also know is that it puts an enormous risk on the neighborhood. And just think for a second, the increase in victims and internal displacements, people who need help inside Syria is one to four, approximately, that proportion. The increase of refugees is one to eight, eight times. And why is that so? Because it is so difficult to get help inside Syria because of the fighting. And that means that people are getting, th their resources to cope are getting exhausted every day that passes. And their only chance is to run. But that is enormously difficult for serious neighbors. For Lebanon in particular, a country that is fragile on its own, that has come from a civil war of its own. And that is today the landing ground for the biggest proportion of Syrians, 770,000 registered refugees. If you take those that are not registered, it is over a million. In other words, the country has grown in population by 25% because of this crisis. For Jordan, King Abdullah, would say that Jordan is hospitable. These are their brothers. But that he is very worried how long that could go without Jordan being destabilized. For Iraq, in Kurdistan, all of a sudden this year, we have seen a huge increase of the flow of Kurdish Syrians running for their lives. 200,000 in six weeks cross the border. And Egypt, that is with huge difficulties on, on, on its own. But, but be beyond the stabilization, destabilization of the, of the region, we have to ask ourselves a very profound question. How long is this going to last? And that takes me to my the humanitarian's outlook of the future of the Syrian crisis. What next? Obviously, we are today more hopeful that there is a chance for a political solution. And obviously, political solution is the only one that can put an end to this madness. No question about it. But how quickly can a political solution be worked out? given that the opposition is completely diversified. And, and uh, uh, in Aleppo, our humanitarian colleagues tell us there are 250 different fighting groups. How are they going to come to together at the negotiating table to form a position? And how willing, let's be, let's be fair and honest about it, how willing is really Assad to negotiate? From his behavior up to now, what is the indication that he is truly keen to get a uh, solution that would make his side give? Uh, we have to, and this is where, for, for the humanitarian community, this is not our job. We are not, we are not engaged in politics. But it is our, our job to speak truth to power. And our call here is to everybody, please work on the basis of realistic expectations. Because wishful thinking harms people. Because of wishful thinking, people die. Last year, what was the wishful thinking? The wishful thinking went like this. Assad must go. Assad must go, Assad must go, Assad must go. And that translated into Assad will go. So, in my trips to the region, September last year, September, October in the fall, regional leaders, the, the Lebanese, the uh, Jordanian le leadership, privately would tell me, we don't think Assad is going to go anytime soon. But publicly, they felt that there was so much 
pressure on Assad must Assad will that they didn't want to be against that political tide. But the result we we face is this. Uh, we we got one year of very dramatic increase of violence in in uh, in Syria, and so what we are praying for is that this time around there will be realistic assessment that a peace process is a must, that the window of opportunity opened because the international community finally found ground for unity because of the chemical weapons, that this has to be used wisely and that we wisely means recognizing the role of everybody in the region. When you listen to political commentaries, usually what do you hear as the main parties of international push for peace? Who do you hear? Which are the countries you hear most? Yeah. And UN, uh, US and Russia. <laughs> what about Iran? Iran has more yield on Assad than Russia. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, they play a very important role. So if we want international process with a, an outcome that brings peace, there has to be a recognition of realities and that there has to be inclusiveness in this process. Again, this is not for the humanitarian community. This is not our job, but it is our job to say that we need peace and peace will come only when there is mobi international mobilization that reflects realities that can bring peace. We know, what we know is that even peace happens tomorrow. Let's see, let's dream, be a bit in the wishful thinking side. Tomorrow there is peace. What does that mean for Syrians inside whose houses are destroyed and for Syrians who have fled, who have nothing to go back to? Years before this catastrophe is overcome. In other words, we are in a protracted crisis situation. And that means we need to help people this year, next year, the year after. And when you look at this protracted crisis scenario from a humanitarian perspective, we, we see two forks, two ways it, it would go. One, the one that we call statu quo plus, there will be a continuous increase of refugees, hopefully not a big increase you know, calming down inside Syria, but because resources of, pe of people are so exhausted, the refugee flow would continue gradually. And two, there could be a change in the statu quo that creates potentially a riskier environment, either because Lebanon gets drawn somehow into a humanitarian crisis at home, or with Hezbollah playing a role in Syria. We, of course, hope that we would stay to start to quo plus, and that over time, not too far in the future, there will be negotiations that would allow to to retain the refugee flows, to, to kind of go, go to, to even preparation for returns. But no time soon we see this crisis becoming a thing of the past. No time, no time soon. And that takes me to what does it mean in terms of action and how we are approaching it from the humanitarian uh, side of the European uh, Union. I, I would say the European Union, of course, has a political engagement. It has uh, two members of the European Union, ad, uh, me uh, permanent members of the Security Council. Actually, we have a member of the European Union that is currently a member of the Security Council that I want to praise, Luxembourg, small country, big role. Luxembourg and Australia were the two countries that persevered for the Security Council to come up with a humanitarian statement, presidential statement. 
short of resolution. It would have been better to be a resolution, but between silence and statement, <laughs> we, take, we take statement. And Luxembourg, Luxembourg has done it. Lu Luxembourg and Australia have, have worked on getting it done. Where we have taken the lead in Europe is indeed on the humanitarian side, and rightly so. EU is the largest donor. We, at, at any one point, we provide 50 to 60 percent of humanitarian aid and development assistance in the world. In this crisis, we have leaned forward from the very beginning. Today, uh, collectively, our member states and the Commission, we are by far the largest donor. We have provided $2.7 billion. US is next. US provided $1.3 billion. W but money is not the only thing. It is very important. <laughs> it will continue to be very important. Where I think the EU has been on the humanitarian side, a very strong voice and will continue to be so, is threefold. First, strong determination to do as much as possible inside Syria. 40% of our money goes inside Syria despite of the enormous difficulties of reaching uh, out to people. Food, medicine, shelter, protection. Second, we were the first to recognize the refugee problem is going to be very massive. 40%, another 40% 40 of, of this 2.7 million billion go for refugees. Three, we recognize that it is not good enough to help refugees. We have to help communities that are hosting them. In Lebanon, uh, 1,400 villages and towns today host refugees. In one third or more of these villages and towns, the refugees outnumber the local population. In Jordan, w you have heard, I'm sure, about Zatari camp, yeah? Zatari camp is the, the fourth largest city in Jordan today. 125,000 refugees next to the city of Zatari. Do you know how big Zatari city is? 3,000 people. I mean, I actually cannot imagine any one of our countries or here in the United States to have a, uh, say, next to Washington is what? Close to a million now? And imagine next to Washington to have 100 times, almost now, no, 80 times bigger, 80 million refugee camp. <laughs> uh, th this is just, I mean, in, 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 in sheer proportions, this is just unthinkable. But what we recognize is that unless we help local communities with schooling and medical care, water supply, for, for Jordan, water is crucial because they don't have it. We are going to see, we actually are seeing clashes between local people and refugees in countries that have been ex incredibly hospitable. And I, I cannot say enough as gratitude of the world to these countries for, for what, they, what, what they do. We are now looking at the, at the future with three priorities in the, in the EU. Our number one priority is raise money. This is an extraordinary crisis we have to, to raise, to continue to raise extraordinary amounts of, of, of money from Europe, obviously from the traditional donors, but also from the countries in the region, from new donors, including from Russia. <laughs> it's, everybody has to chip in for years to come. Second, make sure that we look at ways to raise money that are non-conventional but necessary. And I will give you only one example. Syria used to be a middle-income country. Syria is not a poor country. But Syria's accounts are frozen as a result of sanctions. Well, why not use serious money to feed serious people? Why not the World Food Program being authorized by the Syrian government to use funding to buy food and deliver it for all Syrians, not just those who are in government-controlled areas. We have to be thinking of how can we cope in the future in, in a way that is politically not easy, but is necessary. And now a third priority, we had a meeting yesterday on it, is to work hard on the future of Syria, and the future of Syria are Syria's children. 
50% of the victims of this crisis are kids. And I have been saying it time and again. When I close my eyes and I think of, of the Syria crisis, I don't see a, a face of a soldier or a face of a rebel. I see a face of a girl or a boy. Uh, like uh, a 13-year-old Aisha, who in Lebanon is taking care of her handicapped mother. Aisha works in the field for a very low wage under basically slavery conditions. So I, t I talked to her and to her mom, and I wanted, I wanted to say to Aisha, Aisha, I hope you will go back to school. And I just didn't have the heart to say it, because it would have been a lie. She's not going to go back to school. The best that can happen to her is to get married. So yesterday, we met with um, Uni uh, UNICEF. UNICEF put forward an excellent strategy to support 6 million Sy Syrian children in Syria and outside with protection, psychological support, assistance, but also education. Because unless today we act on serious, serious children, we are going to have a lost generation. We are going to have angry young people who know nothing by, but violence to be those in charge of the future of rebuilding uh, Syria. So let me stop here. Uh, I think in 10 years' time, we would be looking back to what we have done in this crisis. And it would be our public that can help us to do the right thing. So thank you for being engaged. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your candid comments, Commissioner. And um, it's very refreshing to hear you speak about the humanitarian side of the situation in Syria, because in Washington, we frequently get way too caught up in matters of, of high security mm -hmm. and, and lose um, the picture. And I think with Syria in particular, a lot of the stress is falling on humanitarian actors um, who understand perhaps more urgently than anyone of the need to reach a solution mm -hmm. as opposed to just manage the crisis. Um, and so thank you again for your comments. I, I want to ask you a few questions. And, and the first is um, relating to a controversy that we often uh, hear raised uh, in Washington and, and other places. And that's um, about the ways in which uh, the UN and other international actors are distributing aid. And that is via Damascus. Um, and given this, uh, this need to, to sort of work with the government in order to ensure uh, access to the country, how is it that um, European countries, the European Union, um, is working to ensure that aid is reaching both rebel-controlled areas and uh, areas under the uh, domination of, of the regime? Uh, this is uh, actually a bit of misperception that exists in public opinion, that somehow people living under government-controlled areas are those who get all the assistance, and those that are in rebel-controlled areas are deprived. In fact, in our own mapping, and we do a very thorough assessment of what our partners deliver where on the map of Syria, it is just about 50-50, government-controlled, rebel-controlled areas. Where misery is, where people are right to be unhappy for help not getting out to them, is in the so-called contested areas, where the fighting goes on. Their assistance is much more limited. How do we get help across? We have worked very hard to push the Assad government to allow more organizations to operate inside Syria. In the beginning of the conflict, it was only ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, that was allowed to operate in Syria. Today, there are 14 international non-government organizations, specialized humanitarian organizations, 
all the agencies of the United Nations are allowed to operate inside Syria. Uh, I can mention, for example, ACTIT, a very good European, uh, very professional humanitarian organization. They have been very active in Aleppo, both the, the government controlled part of, of Aleppo and the uh, uh, opposition uh, controlled part. A very difficult area with contested uh, parts. Uh, ICRC, ICRC is delivering uh, assistance to both government controlled and, and, and opposition controlled areas. But where, why, peop, why the public has this, this sense that this is not as fair? Because indeed for the United Nations, they need to get for every convoy of humanitarian aid permission from the government. And when they get this permission and the convo convoy crosses, we have had very uh, horrible things like the government people would stop the convoy and take out surgical kits, meaning that a wounded soldier on the other side is going to die. So that has, been, that has been happening. But it is, from our perspective, the coverage, ah, and actually this is, this is one part of the, of the story. The other part of the story is cross-border. Uh, Cross-line, UN does. Uh, Cross-border, UN does not do. But under the, the well, banner, cross-border from Turkey into, into, from Jordan into Syria. This has been for, sover because there is a sovereignty issue, um, Security Council absolutely categorically against, but in the uh, presidential statement, the Security Council actually said people need to be helped. And there has to be uh, a chance to deliver assistance, not only cross lines, but also cross, cross borders. And we have been supporting some of this uh, action. Now, there are lim limitations, and the limitations are that the Turkish government and the Jordanian government, they're very cautious of not being dragged into a war. So th their ability to, to provide for that kind of uh, access is also uh, limited. But just to sum it, to, to sum it up, we, where we must continue to be pressing, it is on the issue of contested areas. And that is access, that is demanding for both sides of the conflict to allow help to reach people. Something that for two years we were very shy to do with Security Council not saying a word that it is wrong to kill civilians and it is wrong to harm humanitarian workers. Now we have the statement, now we need to build on, on it. Okay, so that leads me to one of my other questions, which was that now we have the secu Security Council uh, resolution on the issue of chemical weapon disarmament. We have this presidential s statement calling for increased humanitarian access from uh, the president's see of the Security Council, not a resolution. But, but you seem to think that this statement is, is significant. And of course it is because it, it mentions the need for increased access. It calls on the uh, government in particular as a primary actor of responsibility to, to ensure that access. Um, what are the next steps? Uh, well, the, the next steps are to turn the statement into, into really more access. Uh, and that is pressure from all members of the international community to those sides of the conflict they're closest to. Obviously, Russia can talk to Assad, and uh, the Saudis and Qatar can talk to the uh, uh, opposition uh, fighters. Some of, some of the Western uh, uh, powers can talk to the opposition uh, groups. Uh, we have to recognize that in the opposition, we have the more moderate part, and we also have extreme uh, elements. And those, I don't think anybody can talk to. Uh, and I don't even mean al-Nusra. I mean al-Nusra now, I'm told that in comparison to ISIS, this is the uh, Syria-Iraq Al-Qaeda group, al-Nusra, <laughs> you know, they look moderate. Um, so there we are, because of this uh, dragging the conflict for so long, we now do have a very uh, bad people who I don't think would be amenable to provide taxes. But they are the fringe and then everybody else there has to be pressure with very specific demands convoys to cross lines uh, 
ceasefire. Ceasefire, the, the uh, weapon inspectors cannot do their job without some pressure on ceasefire. Ceasefire must be used to also help people. Politically, this is sensitive because nobody wants to mix up the chemical weapons with, with anything else out of fear that the chemical weapons may not happen because of these other, other issues. But my sense is that it is absolutely crucial that we now measure progress and speak up. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm worried because as we sit in this room, I just learned this morning that visas we have demanded for humanitarian uh, um, actors to go into Syria have not yet been granted. Uh, and if Assad, if the government, I mean, it, it is pressure on the government, it's pressure on the, on, the, in, on the opposition groups. But if we don't see documented evidence that, that there are measures taken to help people, we will have to pressure and pressure again. Uh, and this is where the international community, the, the key c countries have to play their role beyond the chemical weapons also on helping, getting help to people. Because if you're a mother who loses a child to a bullet, not to sarin uh, gas, your grief is as deep and profound as those who have faced the most horrible of weapons. And, and that we cannot close our eyes to that, yes, chemical weapons are now being tackled, but conventional weapons are used in full, full speed. So I want to also ask you about another issue that's been frequently raised in the Syrian context, and that that is the idea of um, imposing protective mm. zones for civilians. And I'm raising this uh, issue not in the context of a, a military intervention mm. to tip uh, the balance of the war, but but I've heard humanitarian actors raise the scenario of perhaps creating uh, protection zones for civilians along the borders, um, because we know there are many IDPs um, who remain inside mm -hmm. Syria along the borders with Jordan and Turkey mm -hmm. and Lebanon who haven't been able to cross into these countries. I mean, is, is our protective zones an option for ensuring better humanitarian access reducing the number of casualties. Mm. Um, do you see this as a good idea for Syria? I mean, anything that can help people to live and be assisted, of course, has to be looked into. The problem with this concept of um, humanitarian corridors or, or safe zones is that if you don't have somebody to protect them, they're not in existence. Then we go into the category of wishful thinking. Short of having peacekeepers, and I actually would think that the next to be thought about is uh, uh, having peacekeepers in Syria in areas that allow that to be, to be the case. If you don't have it, then what is going to happen in this protected humanitarian zones is that they will be used for uh, armed people to rest they will be definitely drawn into the conflict and civilians will be hurt. Also, many uh, people with experience say in a country like Syria that can potentially be broken into pieces, protected zones do bring a bit of a risk of accelerating this breakdown because they, they kind of create enclaves, enclaves that can be then marked as uh, independent Republic of X, and that is that is something to be to be mindful of, of. But just to be absolutely fair, no option should be off the table in such extraordinary uh, circumstances. And if we are in a situation when, in a particular area, for te temporarily we can get more assistance, say in the area between Turkish border and fighting lines. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't discount it uh, uh, like, like this. I mean, we just need to always think of the unintended consequences of any decision uh, we make and how we are managing these unintended uh, consequences. Before I turn it to the audience, I just want to ask, in what forums are people doing this hard thinking? 
Well, we, we, for quite some time, this is, actually a, this is actually a great question, and they are there. For quite some time, we had a real forum on the Syria humanitarian crisis called Syria Humanitarian Forum. Uh, it, it, it was very inclusive. We had everybody there, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, the Syrians themselves. But then we reached the point when uh, it was very clear there were two legitimate sides of the conflict, the Syrian government and the Syrian opposition. But only the Syrian government was allowed to take part. So we, the EU, we said this is unacceptable. We have to have both parties of the conflict. And then the forum died because we could not get consensus with Russia and China to pressure Syria to, uh, to, to, to get the opposition to, to be represented. So what do we have today? We have two things that are two, two uh, groups that are very important. One is the uh, UN agencies and some development organizations because of the impact of the crisis on the, Sy on the uh, Lebanese and Jordanian communities that are meeting on a regular basis. The next meeting would be in a month on October 4th. They review where we are in terms of needs. They, they basically work on, on bottom-up needs assessments, who is doing what, division of labor, and where the donors are very present, in a sense, putting pressure for every euro, every dollar to be stretched to the, to the maximum. Uh, we also have a, a uh, we have taken a, an initiative with the um, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Jordan at the margins of UNGA to meet every year. Well, sorry, I, I shouldn't say that. We were supposed to meet once last year <laughs> because Assad must go, Assad will go. <laughs> but obviously we met this year again and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that there would be a need for that kind of uh, meeting to continue. So we, we do, to, and, and what, is, what is actually rewarding to see is that when the minds are focused on uncalled for suffering, undue suffering, you actually see ideological opponents finding common ground. Okay, thank you. We'll open it up for questions. Um, Michelle, do you want to? Hi, thank you so much. I'm Michelle Strzok from the Syrian American Medical Society from the Syrian American Medical Society. And thank you so much for your work and for being such an advocate on these issues. Um, I, my question is about the presidential declaration and the intervals for reporting. And basically, I agree with everything that you've said. I think we had the opportunity to talk to some of the member states and brought up this concern. And I wanted to hear your opinion about getting basically more reporting if there's a resolution coming up at the Security Council. So frequent uh, specific intervals for reporting by the Secretary General, specific reports so that the Security Council members don't need to review kind of and, and agree on who is going to be reporting to them. Because we know certain countries don't think that it's necessary to have reports on the humanitarian situation that frequently. And also, um, I wanted to ask your opinion on, we heard that there's a high level working group that was supposed to be being formed from the initiative in Jordan on humanitarian aid to replace the humanitarian forum. So do you think Russia would be, and other countries would be willing to take part and bring, that, and, you know, bring opposition humanitarian issues to the table? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, thank you yeah. again. Thank you. Um, do you want us to you collect a couple to, of questions? Okay. Let's, let's collect a, a couple of questions because I, I'm mindful of sure. time. We, we have one here, the blue, and then... Uh, Brian Beery, Washington correspondent for Europolitics. I'm just wondering how the United States and the EU are coordinating their aid efforts. And also, just following up on, on a previous point about the rebel-controlled areas, I've heard that one of the Islamist uh, groups confiscated aid from the European um, uh, European aid. So uh, how much of a problem is this that they're actually confiscating your aid convoys? We, we have one up here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Christy Delafield with the Syrian Coalition uh, Liaison to the Assistance Coordination Unit. Um, my question is a little bit about um, what the EU is looking at in terms of ways to certify and uh, involve new partners, Syrian partners. Um, as the security situation and the access situation has deteriorated, we find that more and more international uh, aid workers aren't going inside Syria um, and that INGOs aren't able to absorb new funding streams to be able to meet the need. 
Um, so there, there's a strong desire within the Syrian community to have more of these um, new Syrian NGOs that are that do have access and are delivering assistance to, to partner them with INGOs and with funders such as the EU. Uh, can Thank you. you. Yeah, uh, let, let me take those and then let's see what what we might have uh, still. Uh, on the presentation, presidential statement, behind the statement is a very prudent professional work done by the uh, UN and the international NGOs that are doing work inside Syria. Uh, Valerie Amos has gone to Syria a couple of times when, the, when she issued her report to the Security Council it outlined very specific steps to be taken to get more access. Like, uh, we know the key routes for humanitarian convoys. Can we have negotiated access for these routes? So we don't have to negotiate every time with a bunch of uh, uh, dysfunctional government agencies to get signatures for the convoys to go. There are uh, issues on focusing on medical facilities. This has been a huge human tragedy to allow hospitals to be bombed, ambulances to be shot at without an outcry internationally. To be, to be honest, I've never seen a conflict of that size in which humanitarian, international humanitarian law is so blatantly trumped over without an outcry in the world. And I keep saying to people, it's not only about Syria. It is about the precedent of tolerance for inhumane behavior that we are setting up and we are not speaking loudly against it. And that, in the statement, we have this all framed in a very concrete, uh, measurable manner. We would like to see, and actually I should have mentioned that before, we would like to see that uh, UN OCHA, UNHCR for the refugees, uh, ICRC on respect for international humanitarian law, that they are given regular platform to the Security Council to report on progress or lack of. And that would be, again, an area for advocacy for the humanitarian community, for all of us, because unless we do it, we would have erosion of something that, that has been achieved on the backs, not on the backs, on the graves of people dying in conflicts. Some humanity, space for humanity even in the, in the most horrible of circumstances. I was, uh, I was just uh, um, two weeks ago at uh, Omaha Beach in uh, France the uh, landing place for the US uh, uh, during the, the Second World War, where thousands and thousands of American soldiers uh, died. And I was standing there saying, you know, we got, because of these tragedies, we got international humanitarian law, meaning don't kill civilians, don't hurt uh, humanitarian workers, don't bomb hospitals. And now this is happening, and we are silent. And that, of course, is, is where the, uh, it, it is not a, Moral, it is a moral issue. It's not just a moral issue. It is a matter of how we live in a world with more asymmetric conflicts and how we protect the, the uh, right of doctors to do their jobs. Uh, in Aleppo, there were 5,000 doctors before the conflict. We were told in April they were 36 and that they're now maybe 10. And just think what it means of destruction of health system of a, of a, of a country. So, so we will continue to be pressing that, that the statement is followed uh, uh, true. And we will continue to be working on replacing the Syria Humanitarian Forum. Let's see how Russia would respond to that, hopefully positively. Uh, and if, we, you know, if, if that avenue doesn't work, what else we, 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 can, we can do? Because we do, we do need everybody on this. Uh, on EU-US coordination, it has been exemplary in this crisis. Uh, we work very closely with uh, two of the uh, uh, US uh, uh, offices, uh, the humanitarian affairs in USAID and uh, the refugee in State Department uh, population and, and, and refugees office. Uh, we compare uh, notes 
on many on pra practically all policy and operational issues systematically because together US and Europe we are the largest uh, uh, contributor to address uh, address this crisis uh, we on the on the question of uh, of confiscation of aid look these are I mean this is a war uh, it is a war it is a war and there are very extreme groups in this war but for fairness to our partners, we actually have been very prudent in delivering uh, aid. And the vast majority of aid funded, not just by the, by the EU, is actually getting to uh, people. The organizations that work inside Syria are very prudent in knowing their limitations. And there is a flip side to that. The fact that we have very, very rare cases of aid being confiscated by groups is because we are prudent in, in how much we operate in contested areas. And to be honest, in my heart, sometimes I lose sleep over this prudency because, yes, we are prudent. But this means that there is a population in Syria in contested areas that is systematically de deprived of aid because we can't take the risk of, of getting uh, there. Uh, my, my huge admiration for the uh, Syrian humanitarian workers that are uh, operating as part of the UN system and uh, the Syrian Red Crescent. 31 uh, Syrian humanitarian workers have been killed in this uh, war. Many more wounded, many, many more kidnapped. I have been on the phone with UNHCR when we were, uh, they were delivering a convoy, stopped, people arrested, and then they're negotiating. Uh, uh, Antonio Guterres called me in case we need to use also EU uh, pressure for the uh, convoy, for the people who, who, who were uh, running the convoy to be released. Uh, people are taking uh, risks, but obviously, when it comes down to crossing lines, crossing lines, this risk is the highest. And when it comes down to delivering contested areas, uh, we unfortunately are not where we, we want to be. I mean, out of the uh, today, about seven, seven, eight million people need help. At best, we get on a regular basis to a third to a half at best on a regular basis. Sorry, I'm, I, I realize that, that we are. But just I think that one of the questions is that could we make better use of... I'm going to okay. that question, okay. yeah. Uh, we have been very conscious in the EU that the only reason, reason people survive in Syria is because of the uh, help they get from local communities. And the community organizations in Syria are very good. Women's organizations, neighborhood organizations. We have insisted for the government to allow us to partner and at one point, we got almost 100 organizations that were allowed to be partners to the, uh, uh, UN, to the EU supported uh, organizations. That list went down to 29. It was trimmed, trimmed by the government. We have a legislative constraint. We cannot work directly with local organizations because the only way for us to be fast in delivering help is by delivering through authorized, certified, if you wish, partners. We have about 200 partners, UN and NGO partners, with whom we have partnership agreements. But we are very keen on these partners building local capacity, delivering through local, uh, especially community organizations. And we have been supporting uh, uh, the assistance coordination unit. We meet on a regular basis. We understand the, the capacity constraint that, that uh, the assistance coordination but unit. This is a uh, Syrian entity. This is a Syrian entity, yes. <coughs> this, is, this is an entity that was established by the opposition to connect with, with the, the world and receive uh, assistance. Uh, so, so, but but you're, you're right to pose this question because we are not succeeding enough to make the transmission line through local organizations work 
as effectively as, as, as possible. Um, some of the NGOs and the ICRC are really good in doing that. Some have less capabilities to ground uh, uh, locally. Obviously, we want to use everybody that is able to, to deliver help. OK. Um, can we, we take have like three minutes left. Any take like uh, burning questions? And I'll try to answer very quickly. One question here. Uh, in the middle. The Hi, my name is Kate Norland. I'm from Human Rights First. Uh, my question is about refugees and refugee resettlement. Um, I'm wondering what you think the role of refugee resettlement is in relieving the strain on Syria's neighbors and whether you think maybe a, a unified EU border policy that, that made it easier for people to uh, get into the EU without putting so much pressure also on Greece and Bulgaria and Italy um, you know, might be a, a useful thing. Thank okay. you. I, yeah. I think we, ha we I had wanted to give Chris an opportunity yes. to ask a question about Palestinians. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Chris McGrath. I'm from UNRWA, from the UN Relief and Works Agency. As you know, Palestinian refugees in Syria have tried pretty hard to stay out of the conflict, but the population, while smaller than, of course, the Syrian population, has been um, disproportionately affected by the crisis. I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that and also what the EU is doing for this population as well. Right, and unfortunately, we will have to wrap it up with these two questions. So on the first question, of course, uh, we have to be thinking ahead. Uh, on uh, the fact that uh, refugee flows will continue and therefore what is today only 50,000 Syrians in Europe is going to uh, go up. My own country, Bulgaria, has seen very rapid increase from very low numbers to now about 100 a day on average crossing Syrian refugees crossing into Bulgaria. Uh, we, this is not my responsibility, this is responsibility of Commissioner Malmström, Home Affairs, dealing with internal uh, matters. And there is a conversation going on in Europe on creating a common uh, framework. Some of our countries are great. Germany, Sweden. Uh, Germany, when UNHCR called for 10,000 uh, humanitarian admissions, Germany said we are taking 5,000. Germany, not very n well known fa fact, has 600,000 refugees on its territory. This is one of the top 10 countries. Actually, I think they are fifth in the world in terms of receiving refugees. But some of our other countries are less forthcoming. I mean, let me be very uh, uh, honest. And uh, we have work to do in Europe to create this mechanism of solidarity. I, my voice has been, my, my statement on this has been crystal clear. Keep our hearts open, our wallets open, our borders open, because this is extra ordinary crisis. And I'll tell you, I have some of my fellow Bulgarians now jumping all over me, saying we don't want the, the refugees, we are poor, we can't accept them. And I'm very firm on this, on this. Solidarity is a two-way street. We have to be, we have to be accommodating people. Uh, but this is going to be a conversation in Europe, in Europe to continue. And, they, and you, will, you will see in, our, in some of our countries, uh, right-wing parties are winning more uh, you know, space with anti-immigration platforms. Uh, so it's going to be a difficult conversation. I believe Europe will come on the right side of this. Huh? It will, but, but, but we, know we, need to, we, need to be, we need to be working uh, on it. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't uh, mention the Palestinians in the very beginning. This is a, this is, these are people who are hit twice. They were refugees, and now they're refugees again. Uh, there, there were about 500,000 Palestinians in Syria looked after very well by, by, by the Syrian government. They were one of the most fortunate ref Palestinian refugees. And then they were drawn into the, into the, into the war. Uh, Palestinian camps are now part of the uh, war field. And Palestinians have very few places they can go to. They, only seven, 8,000 were able to go to Jordan. Jordan is very worried about an increase for, for domestic stability reasons. Uh, about 50, 55,000 have gone to uh, Lebanon. I have gone every time there to, see, to visit Palestinian camps. Horrible, horrible conditions. Imagine a room two by two, I'm not exaggerating, two by two with nine people living in this room. 
Palestinians from coming from uh, uh, Syria. So bad that some would say, I am going back in Syria. I would rather die. This is how difficult conditions are. Uh, there are now Palestinians in Bulgaria. They are clearly cr crossing Turkey for a better, more, more amenable uh, destination. Also Kurdish, Kurdish uh, Syrians uh, in, 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 in Bulgaria. But for the, for the, for the fate of the, of the Palestinians, uh, obviously this, this is where the international community, and, and, and I'm, I'm criticizing myself, we, we, we have to always remember this, uh, uh, this, this, these people because they are hit twice. And I want to end up with one thing. Not only the Syria crisis is horrible for the Syrians, but this is a crisis throwing a long shadow over the rest of the world. I'm going tomorrow to the Central African Republic. Because of Syria, so many places where people suffer are now left a little less attentive, which is a tragedy for those who need our, our help, our attention and help. And thank you very much for, for, for your good questions and your <laughs> participation thank today. You so thank, much. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.